Assalamu alaikum everyone. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, nahmadu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'afiru wa na'udhu billahi min shuri anfusina wa min say'ati amalina min yahdihi lahu falam mudullallah wa may yudhu falahadhiya lah wa ashadu an la ilahi illallah wa ahdahu la sharika lahu wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu rasulu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, so um, does anyone know what the agenda is today? Someone tell me what we planned on discussing. Anyone who got an email? Did you guys see, did you guys check your email? Anyone? I, I didn't. You didn't get it. Who didn't get an email? Raise your hand. There's a problem with the mailing list because even though they add their they add their own cells, but for some reason they still don't get the emails. I think we'll just have to like BCC everyone manually. Maybe that'll be the best way. That's like yeah, that would take like yeah, that would take way too long. We'll figure out the problem. Um, just, just let us know. Uh, maybe if we can get like a signing sheet, like it, just to be mindful of the people who aren't getting it. Maybe we could check and like see what's up. Anyway, we'll, we'll figure out something. All right. So, does, can anyone tell me what we plan on talking about? Anyone who did get the email? Yes. We were talking about gender issues. That's what we plan on talking about today. All right. So why is gender, can anyone tell me why gender is just, it's like a hot topic in Islam? Can anyone tell me why? Am I speaking myself? Can anyone tell me why? Huh? I didn't see your hand. Yes. Uh, I don't know, maybe because, you know, like we're always bombarded by non-Muslims about like how either Muslim men are oppressed and Muslim women or Muslim women are oppressed because they're covered or, you know, something like that. So, or male dominance or something like that. So I think... It's a, it's a hot topic because people always discuss it. Precisely. Exactly the answer I was looking for. Is anyone else going to say that? No, I agree with him. Okay. Okay, well, it's such... Yes, yes. Some Muslims don't even know, like, their... I mean, like, females don't really know their rights either. Like, some don't. They just think that, you know, they're just lesser than men just because their culture teaches that. Yeah. And that's why I believe that it's our duty to, to learn our rights and everything. But yeah, okay. So anyway, and Jazakallah for sharing that. It's such an important topic that you have classes called Women in the Muslim World. Taught here at Montclair State University. You don't hear classes called Women in the Buddhist World, Women in the Hindu World, Women in the Christian World. Any of you guys heard about a class like that here? No. But I had a class last semester, Women in the Muslim World. Okay. So we established it's an important topic because there's this perception that uh, Muslim men are superior and they oppress their women, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the issue that I want to specifically talk about is gender equity. And I said, now can anyone tell me why I say gender, gender equity, not equality? Why I'm being specific with my wording? Can anyone tell me why? No? Okay. Well, I'm using the word equity rather than equality. It's a more suitable word than equality. Uh, men and women are naturally different. And as, as a result of their differences, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's given them different roles. He's diff given them different obligations, etc., etc. Now, um, anyway. So equity, it deals with something that being fair, just, socially right, you know, it doesn't necessarily deal with the exact same treatment or the exact same thing. Now, whether the word equality would deal with the, someone receiving the exact same thing. Um, now, the following example illustrates this point. It is analogous for two persons who possess two diverse currencies that, you know, they numerically, they may equal something totally different. Now, let's say the one... Like, they both equal a thousand U.S. dollars, though. But one might be, like, you know, a billion Japanese yen, and then something else might be, like, you know, like 24 euros, whatever. But let's just say they equally equate to a thousand dollars. It doesn't matter, you know, which number is bigger, as long as they're fair and just, and they're equal in, in the sense of, in that sense. So that's why equity is a more suitable word than equality, as, you know, because... Men and women, they have different rights and obligations, different roles, etc. So equity is a better word than equality. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to say that Islam does give uh, men and women equitable rights and that it's fair and just with them. Now, 
There's no denying that you you will find Muslim men who oppress their women. You know, I'm not I'm not denying that. But that I would say that they're transgressing Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Sunnah when they do that, because that's not in the teachings. Prophet Muhammad never, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he never oppressed his wives or anything. Okay, so let's look at some examples of how the gender gender equity. Okay, so now you got this. Now in theory, particularly within the United States, there's this. Um, even though it's seldom practiced, there's this theory that men and women should work together in order to, you know, make a great household and work together rather than compete with another, with one another. And even though it's seldom practiced, it you know, you, it's, ideally that's what people say everything should be. But you do have spouses who compete with one another. But essentially in Islam, that's the goal: for men and women to work and complement one another to benefit their household and benefit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that is the Islamic position. Um, so you have this common misconception that a woman's testimony in Islam, it's not equal to that of a man's. So can anyone give me a specific example where they say, ha, you know, women, they're, they're a half a man because their testimony is not equal. Can anyone give me a specific example from the Quran? Okay, well you have the longest ayah in the Quran, Surah Baqarah, verse 282. It speaks about the Muslims when they're recording debts. Oh, you who you believe, when, there's a, when you contract a debt, you have to write it, write it down. It's an obligation that you have to write it down. And then at the end, you know, I'm skipping through the ayah because the ayah is so long. But then it says, and bring two witnesses from among your men. And if there are not two men available, then bring a man and two women. And then it also says, from among those who you accept as witnesses, so that if one woman errs, then the other can remind her. And, you know, th there's much more in the verse, but it's very long, so I'm not going to say it all of it. So then when a non-Muslim, uh, you know, a non-believer reads this, someone who's like maybe like an Orientalist, they'll say, ha, you see, a woman is a half a man, you know? Needs two women's testimonies to equal one of that a man. And you get people like Robert Spencer. Robert Spencer actually tried to say that this verse was talking about like rape cases and stuff because he obliterated part of the verse and then just slapped this in there. So you have to watch when people say it. But anyway, so, but this is only in the case of financial transactions, though. And you have some scholars who made interpretation as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it like this. You know, some scholars have said it's woman's biological nature that made her more prone to error than a man. Some, some said that uh, it was a woman's different nature, being that uh, she was more prone to error. Rather than she, one scholar said that it's the different economic roles, you know, like, a woman, she's more, you know, available in housework. She's more used to that type of stuff. And a man, he's more outside doing the financial transactions. So that's why it's more his realm. And a man would be more likely to make an error in household matters rather than a woman. So, and then there's another one saying that it's a woman's motherly instincts is the reason why she's more prone to error. But anyway... It's obvious that several Muslim scholars have I interpretations to why, what this verse means. But in reality, we, you know, we can make interpretations, but can anyone say that for 100% sure that they know what the reason is? But anyway, we're not, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's word is, you know, it is what it is. It's his wisdom. We don't know why. But we accept it, though. Uh, but we have to kind of like, you know, throw our arrogance out the window and say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best of his wisdom, why he made it this way. But he did make it this way. So, but let's look at the other situations, though. Um, so while it's ever in, in the case of recording debts that men and women, uh, that men's testimony is worth that than more of men's, let's look at a different testimony. Let's look at it. Can anyone think of a different example? Well, let's, I'll, I'll actually bring it up. What about when men and women, uh, boys and girls, are breastfed together? I'll give you an example. In Islam, if a boy and a girl are breastfed together, they become brothers. Now, there's a hadith in Sahih Bukhari where this man, uh, he, he has a wife, and a woman comes to him saying, you know, how could you guys be married when I, you know, suckled the two of you? And the man, he doesn't know of this, you know, he, he doesn't remember this incident. So he goes and asks his father-in-law, and his father-in-law is unaware of it either. So then, then the matter goes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, he listens to what everyone has to say, and he listens to what the woman has to say, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he tells him, you know, 
he accepts the woman's testimony over two different men. You have two different men's testimonies that are both different. You know, neither of them knew about this situation. But yet you have one woman who's testifying. And the Prophet Sallallahu he took the, the woman's testimony over both men's testimonies. And he said, you know, that they should be divorced because, you know, they were breastfed together. And the reference for the hadith, it's narrated by Abdullah ibn Mulaika from, and then it's passed down from Uqba bin al-Harith. Like I said, it's in Sahih Bukhari. Volume number three, book number 48. Anyway, so like I said, two totally different situations, but you have the woman's testimonies being um, accepted over the man's. Um, so let's look at another case. Now you have the case of adultery in the Quran, Surah An-Nur, and I'll read the verse. And those who accuse their wives of adultery and have no witnesses except themselves, then the witnesses of one of them shall be for testimonies. Swearing by Allah that indeed he is of the truthful. Uh, and the fifth oath will be the curse of Allah upon him if he should be among the liars. But it will prevent punishment from her if she gives four testimonies. Swearing by Allah that indeed he is of the liars. And the fifth oath will be the wrath upon her if she's of the truthful. So now in the case of adultery, adultery you have both men and women testifying equal amount of times. And their testimonies are considered equal. Um... You know, there doesn't need to be any witnesses involved. Doesn't need to be, you know, an additional specific gender to, you know, equal it out. Um, so right now, I already, in, just in the cases of testimonies, I discussed, I discussed three different testimonies. I discussed recording debts, adultery, and breastfeeding. One where the man had, I guess you could say, like a superior authority in testing over rights. One where the women did, and one where um, they were both equal. So can we say that? Oh, a man in testimonies, he's superior over a woman. You can't say that. Maybe in some cases, but they're still equitable, though, because they're still just and fair. Women have more right in some. Men have more right in some. Okay. So let's look at the, uh, the issue of inheritance. Now, another significant issue, uh, this, you know, this is also significant. People will tell you, oh, you know, women inherit that, uh, half of that of men. They're inferior. They're oppressed, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, well, let's, you know, the notion comes from the Quranic verse, Allah instructs you concerning your children for the male, what is equal to the share of two females. So generally speaking, and that's in Surah al Nisa, verse 11, generally speaking, a man inherits, you know, twice that of a female, generally speaking. But there's also, you know, this is a whole big issue where there's many conditions and stuff. Like, you know, for instance, if it's, you know, it also has to deal with like, you know, gender, like if it's a younger generation, they inherit more than someone who's older who doesn't need that money. So you can have an old man, but a young girl would still inherit more than him. So there's, you know, there's a lot of cases. But we're looking at cases where the, ch the children like equal age. Um, so while a boy may inherit more, he still is responsible for all his female relatives. That is, his wife, his sisters, his mother, his daughter, etc. And if you look at it, a married woman, she doesn't have to contribute a penny to the household budget. If she does, it's out of her own courtesy and it's maybe out of necessity. But she's not obligated to do that. Um, so essentially the sole responsibility for finances comes from the husband. So while he may, in yes? I just wanted to add, if you actually calculate it, the woman actually gets more. Yeah. Because you want to emphasize more on that? Um, I took a class of that um, last year. But according to my memory though, um, the fact that the man has to support her means that, and she also gets her own share and of his course. share, all part of his share, which means that if you calculate, if you add them up, she gets more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in that class, they also said that um, a woman will inherit from more people. Yeah. So if you actually if you end up calculating it, if not equal, she actually ends up. Um, getting more. And this is why it ties into equity rather than equality, because it may be different, the circumstances which they inherit, but it's still just and fair. Yeah, it is, because like the man, he's may, maybe initially he'll inherit more. But, you know, he still has, he has that responsibility and everything. So to go, yeah, so anyway, like I said, the sole responsibility for all the finances is on the husband, but he has still, he's responsible for providing everything. And the woman's money, whatever she receives, it's essentially, it's just hers. Whatever he receives, it's his, but it's hers also. Okay. So no one can really say that men are superior in the terms of, uh, Inheritance. Uh, okay. Um, I'm skipping some stuff, but uh, 
Now, let's look at the issue of um, women being able to work. You have people who say, oh, you know, Muslim men, they forbid their wives from working, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, you know, there may be scholars who have different opinions on this, but I guess you could say, generally speaking, if there is, you know, like a husband, and obviously it has to be in the contract and everything, a husband can forbid his wife from working if there's no need for it, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it comes from Islamic principles. There's no doubt about that. But there are certain conditions for it. You know, um, the first being the stability of the family. You know, does the family have children that need to be raised? That is the woman's first uh, obligation. I'm going to read a quote from Dr. Jamal Bedoui. Do you guys know who he is? Okay. It should be stated that in Islam, regard, uh, in regards to her role in society as a mother and a wife, as the most sacred and essential one, neither maids nor babysitters can possibly take the mother's place as the educator of an upright, complex, free, and carefully reared child. Such a noble and vital role, which largely shapes the future of nations, cannot be regarded as idleness. Uh, this may explain why a married woman must secure her husband's consent if she wishes to work, unless her right to work was mutually agreed to as a condition at the time of marriage. So this above quote it, it, it illustrates you know, how crucial a mother's role is in raising the children, and you know, how most men, even if they tried their best, most men, they could never do the same job that a mother could do with the same success. Um, now let's keep in mind that there's no ruling in Islam where a man can forbid his wife from working if there's a need for it. There is no ruling. If she needs to work, man can't forbid her. Um, so can anyone tell me like maybe like one of the most significant points to emphasize this point? You know, like women working. Can anyone give me an example of a Muslim woman working? Come on, I know you guys. Khadija radiallahu anha? Now she was such a successful businesswoman, you know, she employed the Prophet Sallallahu Did he ever forbid her from working? No. And you could say that there was a need for her to work and support him because he was out giving dawah and spreading the message of Islam. You know, he couldn't, he couldn't exactly have your nine to five job and be constrained and still spread his message the way that he was. So it was a need for it. And so any Muslim man who unjustly prevents his wife from working when there's need for it, He's transgressed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sunnah. Um, so you might say that a, a husband has a right over his wife in terms of preventing her from working. You know, it may be his right. But um, that's only if there's a financial you know, need and there's kids that need to be... Now let's examine the opposite side of the spectrum. So let's look at financial responsibility. As stated earlier, the husband, he's completely responsible for working and providing where the woman is not. Now the Quran states, Surah an nisa verse 34, Men shall take full care of women with the bounties which Allah has bestowed um, more abundantly upon the, the former than on the latter. And with that they must spend out of their possessions. Thus if a man, you know, if a man wants to be lazy and not work, then he's, he's going against his uh, wife's right. You know, he's transgressing his wife's right. It's his obligation to... So she has a right upon him in terms of financial responsibility that, hey, there's children that need to be raised, you need to provide for me. So if a husband, you know, if I just say, oh, I don't want to work, I'm transgressing my, my wife's limit. Just like the man who's forbidding his wife from working when there's a need for it, he's transgressing her. Okay. Okay. So, so again, two different things. But are they both just and fair? Yes, they are. We don't know exactly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wisdom for everything, why he may have put, but we can look at the wisdoms and say, yes, it is just and fair. Okay, so in responsibilities, you know, like I said, they're, they're equitable. Now, let's look at women teaching men. Can you guys give me a specific example from the sunnah about this? Aisha. Aisha radiallahu anha. So you know, people will say, you know, Islam oppresses women. They're not allowed to teach men, you know? You, we've heard this, haven't we? Have we heard this? No. Yes, no, maybe so. Anyway, but I, I've heard it. Uh, culturally, uh, culturally, yeah. But let's say if, if a woman has specific knowledge that a man doesn't have in a certain topic, like certain hadiths that Aisha uh, radiallahu narrated, could anyone else have known those hadiths? No. no. Now, if there's you know, sp some specific Islamic knowledge that a, that a Muslim woman has that you know, some men can benefit from, is it haram for her to teach? I, I would say I would say no, in my opinion. 
But um. So anyway, let's look at let's look at the Sunnah. So Aisha, she was one of the most top narrators of Hadith. She narrated some two thousand two hundred and ten Hadith, roughly, that are attributed to her. So you now this is clear that during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu that many males learned and took knowledge from Aisha. Um, because they recorded her hadith and they passed them down to other um, people who narrated hadith and people who compiled these. Now, I'm going to quote you something from a secular scholar, someone who's totally, you know, not with Islam. And the woman says, the very fact that woman's contribution to this important literature indicates that at least the first generation of Muslims, the, generators, the generation closest to the Jahiliyyah days uh, and the Jahiliyyah attitudes towards women and their immediate descendants had no difficulty in accepting women as authorities and people to derive knowledge from. But it wasn't just Muslim men during the time and the you know the time the close times to the Prophet that accepted women as a source of knowledge. It was also afterwards. So let's look at um, Muhammad al Bukhari and Muslim Ibn Hajaz, the two most significant compilers of hadith books. Both of them, if you look in both their books, they com they contribute about three hundred Sahih hadith hadiths to Aisha radi anha. Now both of these men, they died like 250 years after the Hijrah. So you know they weren't they weren't around during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu So you have Muslim men at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taking women as uh, knowledge, and then you have people even in the generations after who we consider the most important in terms of compiling Hadith books. They also accepted women as you know a source to, de to derive knowledge from. Um, so again, it's equitable in the realm of teaching others. You know, and this is evident because. You know, we use examples from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Anyway, now let's look at spiritually. Can anyone... Well, hold on. Let's look at prayer. What is prayer? What is prayer an act of? Can anyone... What is prayer an act of? It's an act of worship, right? So people say, oh, men and women, they don't have equitable rights in terms of worship. And one of the things they'll point to is a woman can't lead prayer. Right? You've heard, we've heard this, right? But subhanAllah... As we said, prayer is an act of worship. Now, does it say anywhere in the Quran or the Hadith that the Imam, the one leading the Salah, receives more reward? Have any of you guys heard of that Hadith? I haven't heard of it. Any of you guys heard in that verse in the Quran where it says that? I haven't heard that either. Um, now, scholars say that the reasoning for the Imam so, you know, solely being a man is to preserve modesty issues. Um, Dr. Jamal Badawi, who I quoted before, by the way, I'm, I'm quoting him because he wrote a nice book on the issue of gender equity, and it's very small. It's very readable. You could read it maybe in like an hour or two. Anyway, so he says, Leading the prayer is purely a religious act, and given the format of Muslim prayer and its nature, it is not suitable for women to lead a mixed congrega congregation. You know, maybe for like, you know, the act of men, you know, viewing a woman while praying behind her. It's not appropriate. Um, now, it's a very mainstream, mainstream belief among scholars. Okay, so let's look at a, uh, an ayah in the Quran where men and women are considered equal in their acts of worship. And this is in Surah Az-Zab, verse uh, 35. Indeed, the Muslim men and the Muslim woman, the believing men, the believing woman, the obedient man, the obedient woman, the truthful man, the truthful woman, the patient man, the patient woman, the humble man, the humble woman, the charitable, charitable man, the charitable woman, the fasting man, the fasting woman, the women who guard their private parts, and the women who do so, uh, the men who remember Allah, and the women who do so. For them, Allah has prepared forgiveness and a great reward. So you could say that a lot of these acts are, are acts of worship and, you know, acts of remembrance of God. And essentially, prayer is the same thing. So, um, so for someone to say that a man, just because he's leading the Salah, is getting more reward in the spiritual realm, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's eyes, it makes no sense. So while a man can lead prayer, which a woman necessarily can't do, they're still receiving the same reward. So it might not be a quality where, oh, you know, they can both lead salah. It's still equitable because prayer is just, it's just an act of worship. Who cares if you're leading it or not? You're still receiving the same reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is essentially that's, that's all you want out of your prayer. You don't want to be the guy who, you know, recites Quran nicely and people talk about you, but your intentions aren't right and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to, you know, hold you accountable for that. You want to be the person who has a good salah who's getting that reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which the man and the woman they have exactly the same. 
Okay, so what have we talked about? Can anyone tell me some of the things we talked about, some of the cases that we talked about where men and women have equitable rights? Nothing? No one? Am I really that boring? Can anyone get... Yes. Breastfeeding, yes. So that's a case of, that's a case of testimonies because the, they, the Prophet ﷺ, he took the woman's testimony over two different males' testimonies. Anyone else? Anything? Yes. Inheritance. Inheritance. Yes. Anything else? Working. Working. Yes. Specific. So. The woman used to speak to all the other Shiites. Used to be a. Yeah. To talk. It wouldn't be some type of you know straight talking to each other and looking at her. Of course, she was covered up. Mm hmm. Some type of barrier for her to speak to them in a way. Yes. Where the woman in Medina, if they were, if, if the men took one step, something wrong, or he tried to transgress in any way, they would say something. Mm -hmm. You know that that's even culturally different because of the tribes. Each tribe had their specific, you know, made the women were that way. You know, that's like something that I want everybody to know. for sharing that with us. Appreciate that. Any anything else? Anyway, so we talked about testimonies. Inheritance cases, rights upon the opposite gender, and we also talked about ibadah, worship. And I believe that no one can argue in any of those things. Like you'll, you'll find some cases where maybe a man has more right, and then you'll find some where maybe a woman has more right. But essentially, they're all equitable. They're fair and just. They might not be equal. They might not be exactly the same, but they're equitable. They're fair and just. So, um, and I think that the feminist movement, I guess, is important. But you talk about this radical feminist movement where women have to do exactly the same things as men. And there was a good quote from Yasmin Mujahid, where I can't, I can't remember it exactly, but she, she spoke about things where how the women had to, you know, in order to, you know, I guess, like, improve her role in society, she had to go out and do the same exact things as men. You know, she had to go out, you know, if men were, you know, you know, boxing and stuff, then a woman had to go out and box. And if a man had, you know, was in the workforce and, you know, fixing cars and stuff, then a woman had to go and do that. And at the, at the same token, they were abandoning their right, their God-given right that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them as being mothers. You know, they were getting away from the children and stuff. So you should, we shouldn't mention, I mean, women and men shouldn't compare themselves to one another. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, I wish, I really wish I had that quote, but I don't have it, so... Alhamdulillah. Um, with that, um, I don't want to keep you guys too much longer. Uh, does anyone have any closing comments to make about this issue or anything? Yes. Say, uh, what are you saying? Uh, men and women are equal halves of a whole. They're not the same half, but they both make a whole together. Yeah. I have to look at it like a yin yang symbol. You know, they're both different. They look the same, but they're different. Each one has its own rights, each one has its own color. And, you know, men have their own rights in Islam, and so do women. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the men are the protectors and maintainers of the women. Mm -hmm. So we protect and we maintain the women. And we have rights over them and they have rights over us. They might be different depending on the situation. And we could say that the women protect and maintain the men because they're in charge of raising the next generation. You know, if the next generation is brought up upon bed, then you know, what do you have? And that's, that's, a, that's a crucial role, yes. are physiologically different so to try to make two unequal things equal is unjust at least that's how I see it you know so that's really not if, if they're saying like okay if a man can do this a woman can do this or a woman can do this a man can do this well I mean we're physiologically biologically different and to try to make them equal is unjust would you guys agree with me yeah. yes. <laughs> and that's essentially what I'm just trying to I mean, say like, yes
have, there's no such thing as individuals, and we all work together to help each other. In the West, due to the fact that some women do have to independently get their way in everything, you find women going to an extreme limit that is not really like part of the nature of a woman, you know? Mm -hmm. You'd find that, I mean, there's certain jobs that a woman that would work, that a husband, of course, he would maybe have an issue with. And of course, there's a lot of jobs that a woman can work where the husband would be okay with. I mean, if somebody's married to his wife, of course, she's going to be protected over, and she's going to a place which is all men. And, I mean, would that make him feel comfortable? Or if she's teaching in Islamic school, or if she's teaching somewhere, you know, where he would feel comfortable. Because there's some situations, those situations that uh, husbands and wives have here. Yeah. What, what was that? Said it was all about what they can compromise for each other. Yeah. 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 I I feel like nowadays people don't value like the mom that stays at home, do you know what I mean, takes care of her children. But I know like most girls do want to stay home and take care of their children, but the only thing stopping them is like, oh, you know, that's looked down upon, and she's like a failure because she doesn't have a job, or she's not like a huge career. Or <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I, I mean, what, what it really comes, what it really comes down to is, you know, the woman is doing that for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. She wants to raise the children well, you know. So I mean, if you're doing something for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, you shouldn't care what someone else thinks if they're thinking that you should do something different, you know. So that's what it really comes down. I mean, if, yeah, go ahead. Like it depends on how you can stable, like stabilize your um, time with it, you know. Like I feel like if you can do both, then that's great. Go ahead, do a superwoman, right? But if you can't, like I feel like a woman should choose her household before her job. I feel like I women agree. nowadays are expected to be the superwoman, the one that yes. takes care of her house and also has this future career. But some women, their main focus is their family. They just want to put all their attention towards their family, and then but that they're not looked on as. Yeah, and essentially that's that's really all that matters. I mean, you know, if someone likes what you're doing, and you know, because you're doing it for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, then, okay. but I mean, yes. Put it to one scale. Let's say a woman working, a wife making her money, and a woman raising her kids. Which one gets more outcome, a better outcome, more beneficial outcome? You know, like you, you would see wives like let's say she's working 10, 20 years of her life, and her kids are growing up. What's going to happen to her kids? What if she stays home for 10, 20 years of her life? That's she might have totally different kids. I mean, my mom, she worked when I was a kid, like a little, but then she was teaching in Islamic school, but then what, well, she, she did everything with us. My mom stayed doing homework with me until I was fifth grade. She didn't let me, she like, she knew I was gonna like fly away, but you know, do something else. So really, it really makes a difference with the mother and the kids. Prophet he said, uh, Muhammad narrated, I'm saying Arabi. He put the woman, the mother, three times before the father. Like imagine how much the mother contributes to the children. She raises them. Like you said before about you know the generations to come, it's all about the woman. I mean the father just brings the money, but what does the mother do? The mother she has the real job. You know. It's not all about money. Yeah. I tend to forget that. I agree with Sister Sabrina, you have something? Yeah, I think one of the, the things that, you know, Brother Rebuki made a good point about is that we don't, we don't mention to the West that the, the respect of a mother in our society. And another thing is that, you know, if you know something and you can explain it to the West, explain it. You know, like, remember the example that we had a couple of weeks ago where, you know, uh, a woman was asking, well, why do we have to pray behind the men or you have to pray behind the men and I don't get it. And her brother just simply stood up and was like, okay, this is how we pray. And showed her exactly how we pray. And she had like an aha moment. She was like, now I understand why you guys pray for him and men. And if you can explain it in a good way, explain it to them. You know, it can enlighten them in a way that you didn't think that you can enlighten them. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Anyone else have anything to add? Yes. I just, I just wanted to say, like, you know, like, um, like how they're saying like it's looked down upon as being a mother and 
always like career first and stuff. But it's just really the way society has become. Like it's just a cultural thing, really. I mean, back in you know a few years ago, maybe 20, 30 years ago, it wasn't like that. It was always like look like that. it was actually always good. Like you know, girls back in the day, they couldn't even wear like it looked really bad to wear a skirt past your knees or I mean above your knees or anything. But now it doesn't matter. So the culture is always going to keep changing. But the difference is that Islam is always what it is, you know. And we don't need to change for anybody's culture. And if it looks down upon them, that doesn't matter. Because, you know, like you said, we're doing it for the sake of Allah. And, you know, as Muslims, we know that Allah knows best for us. So. Um, you, from the first example you mentioned about, like, the testimonies, that was only, um, I remember Sheikh Khalid said that, um, the it's only for that example. Yeah. Not for, not for any other, like, if she were to, te- like, to testify in front of a judge, her testimony is equal to a man's testimony. It's only in that example where they would only need two women. Because that's something that's in a man's field, and that's why it requires to have two women. Yeah, I mean, like, I've heard, I've heard scholars say, you go to Wall Street, and look at all the difference between men and women. He would say it's got to be in at least 95% men working there. So, like, men are more, you know, relevant, and they know, might know more about financial transactions, you know, versus the woman who doesn't. So maybe their knowledge is more in that field. Now, is, you know, like I said, we don't exactly know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't tell us the specific reasoning, but we know that there's wisdom behind it. And maybe that is the reason. Allah, wow. So, um, yeah, I've heard scholars made interpretations about that. But yeah, like I said, it's only that case. Because you look at other testimonies, like which I brought up, women has more right. And then you look at the cases of adultery, like I brought up, testimonies were exactly equal. And I know that, like, um, Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said that, um, if a woman has, you know, like if she works in like a financial transaction field where she has knowledge of that, you can bring one man and one woman and it's exactly the same. Now that's his opinion. I don't know how many people agree with him, but you know, I'm saying, you know, there are, he's a very significant scholar and that's his opinion. So, alhamdulillah. It's 410. Uh, I don't want to, if anyone else has anything to say, please say it. If not, then I will end this.